everybody here uh, tonight and um, thankful for you to uh, come and, and study with us. As I told you this morning, we're going to start a, a new series today and, and uh, look forward to it each week on Sunday nights as we go through this year, um, with the exception of Sing Night. And uh, we'll be studying specific words and uh, trying to deepen our understanding of God's message to us and, and uh, grow in our understanding of not only his will for our lives but our mission and uh, the things that we hope to accomplish as his people in this life and so tonight as we consider one word that word of course is Jesus and uh, we're going to consider the word tonight uh, Jesus Christ and uh, consider him and remember him I'll tell you what some of the uh, Bible class teachers will be teaching on some of the same words as we go through this uh, this year and I think that it'll be helpful uh, there is a, uh, a devotional book that goes along with the study that we'll be enjoying also and I have that in a digital copy if you would like a copy of that you just let me know and I can email it to you and uh, it can be something that you follow along with at home and um, then also use it for the Bible classes and uh, for our for our times in worship also. So tonight as we consider uh, the Word of God, as we consider Jesus, um, I, I want to remind you of a song. I don't know if you've heard this song before. It's called Ancient Words. It was mit written by Michael W. Smith. We sing it often with the uh, college groups and with the youth groups. But here are some of the lyrics to that beautiful song. It says, Holy Words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. It's a beautiful song, and uh, I enjoy uh, hearing it uh, as, uh, as we praise God together. But I encourage you as we consider the words and the importance of words tonight and through this year, uh, that that song would be one in your heart also. Um, <clears throat> see, words have the power of life and death, do they not? My dad, of course, uh, you know him, as a, as a, has served as a, as a sheriff, a, a deputy, a uh, police officer most of his life, but also a preacher. And one of uh, the illustrations that I remember him using in his uh, ministry was talking about being a policeman and a preacher at the same time and he would uh, then illustrate that by talking about how as a policeman uh, they have a gun at their side they have a weapon that is uh, charged to them to use in the course of their duties and that that weapon can be used to give life and it can be used to take life and then he related that also to the Word of God and how that words have the power to give life and words have the power to take life. It's a good illustration to remember the heaviness and the weightiness of words and the words that we use when we talk to one another and when we talk to those who we might influence. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it tells us there, the word of God is living and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He says God's word is so powerful. God's word is one that can go right into our hearts, that can go in there and help us not only to understand who we are, but then direct our steps into being the person that he designed us to be in the first place. You see, God has given us a guide. He has given us instructions, and it is a, a wonderful and, and uh, inspired text in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16 and 17, it tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says there's every good work right here in the Scriptures, right there in your Bible, that you might know 
what God has said. When he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, what he's saying is these are words that are breathed out from God. That it is his very word. Now the fact is we have many different translations and we understand that. In the English language we have over 50 translations of the Bible. And yet, at the same time, even though we might uh, use different words to describe the same thing in those translations, we can still go back to the original, and we can still know that each of those translations is based on what the Bible, what God's inspired words actually says. And so we can trust our Bibles, and we can look into them to understand God's will for our lives. Words are truly important, and we have a responsibility to know His words and to cherish them as the words by which he saves us. He tells us in James 1 and 21 that the implanted word is able to save our souls. What a beautiful statement about the word of God. You know, there is an incredible biblical accuracy uh, when you go into the Bible and actually examine how we have been given and how we have the things that we have. In Acts 20 and verse 32, it says, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He says the word is able to build you up. It has a power. It has the ability to build you up, to give you an inheritance, as, as, as was said in James 1.21, to save you. He says this is a powerful word that can build you up, that can deliver you into this inheritance to all those who are sanctified. You know, while other works of men who lived near the time of the New Testament have only one to uh, up to maybe a hundred copies that are still uh, existing, the fact is there are about 5,357 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. When you add to that uh, the Syrian, the Latin, and the Coptic manuscripts that have been discovered, the number is well over 14 thousand copies of the New Testament. Just think about that for a moment. Any other works that, that, that were done around the same time in the history of man, you might have a hundred copies, possibly. Possibly. But the Bible, the New Testament, has 14,000 copies. It's been written down 14,000 times. And because there's over 14,000 manuscript copies of the New Testament, comparing these manuscripts easily reveals any place where a scribe might have made an error or where there's a variation. Now, when you look into the scriptures and you recognize a variation, uh, what you will find in those 14,000 copies is about 150,000 variations in those manuscripts. So yeah, there were some scribes who got some things a little bit wrong. Uh, they they uh, might have spelled a word wrong, or they might have gotten their punctuation off. And so we can count about 150,000 variations. That sounds really bad, doesn't it? However, these variations represent only 10,000 actual places. 10,000 Places, Because if a word is misspelled in 3,000 copies, that's counted as 3,000 variations. And so as one scribe copies another scribe, he reproduces the variation. He reproduces the error. And it continues and continues all those who copy from that scribe. And so here you have 150,000 variations, but really you only have about 10,000 when you go back and look. And of these 10,000 places, all but 400 are questions of spelling, grammatical construction, or order of words. All but 400. And then of the remaining 400 variation, only 50 are of significance, such as two copies that leave out Acts 2 and verse 37, where the people are pricked in their heart and they ask what they should do. That verse as two copies leave it out completely. And there are other places that leave out sections of Scripture, like uh, part of Mark uh, chapter 16. There are things like that, but there's only 50 of them. And of those 50 remaining variations, not one alters even one article of faith, which cannot be abundantly sustained by other undoubted articles that there are no variations in. Some copies date as early as 130 A.D., which is right at the completion of the New Testament. And these are identical to copies made in 900 A.D. It's incredible how accurate the scribes truly were. 
And as Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is possible to know the truth. We can have confidence in this Bible. We can know that we hold the very words of God, that God has spoken to his creation and that you hold that in your hands. You have that on your phone, maybe. You have it right there before you, easily accessible. The power of God, his words, right there with you every single day. In Matthew 24, 35, he said, The worlds will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. His word is strong. It is sure. In fact, in Psalm 19, the Holy Spirit in, inspires the message to be given to us. Starting in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, they are true, and they are righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is a great reward. The incredible accuracy of the Bible cannot be changed. It can't be hurt. It can't be damaged. There have been many throughout history who have tried who have assailed the accuracy of the scriptures only to find the perfection that God has delivered into our hands, the perfect word of God. And so we consider the word of life, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, starting in uh, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Down in verse 14, he follows it up by saying, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He says this word, the power of God in creation, the power of God uh, that was the creative force of bringing everything into existence. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. This is eternal coming into the temporal. This is, uh, this is the, the powerful coming into a, a body of flesh, of weakness. This is God himself entering into the realm of man, entering into his creation in order to save his creation from itself. You see, Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate word. Jesus reveals to us our Father in God. In John 14 and verse 7, as he's speaking to his disciples, he says to them, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. And Philip said to the Lord, Show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, I, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does these works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He says, you've, you've seen what I've done. You've seen the miracles performed from my hand. You've seen the uh, things that were totally against nature that I was able to do, and it's not just because of me, it's because of the power of God in me, Jesus says. He says, this is the Father. And so Jesus reveals the Father to us. Without Jesus, we would not know. Without Jesus, we couldn't understand. We wouldn't be able to conceive. And yet God comes to us in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, to help us wrap our minds around his greatness, his glory, and his presence. So Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus is also the divine reason, the logic behind the revelation. He's the reason of the revelation. He makes the uh, revelation make sense. He w is what brings all of the truth together that we might understand. As you start at the beginning in Genesis 1 and you go all the way through the book of Revelation, what you see is one word, glorified Jesus Christ. You see one perfect story 
as it teaches us about the redemption of man, as it teaches us about God, the Creator, giving us life and then saving us, buying us back from the life that we chose. This is Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, notice with me the reason behind Jesus. It says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery of which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this ministry among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, listen, the whole of Scripture has been written, has been given so that you would understand that God wants to live in you. He wants to live through you. And he wants to deliver you from this body of death into a life everlasting. Into a life eternal in his presence in heaven for all eternity in the glory of God. This is the mystery. This is the secret. This is the truth that Christ is in you. And you have a hope of glory. Jesus is our reason. Jesus is also the divine power that created the word in the first place. Colossians 1 and verse 16, it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dimensions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and all things were created for him. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. So a study of words, it must begin with Jesus, mustn't it? Must, mustn't it start with Jesus Christ and, and even end with Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the greatest of all, the one who can redeem us from a lost and fallen world, Jesus, the Word of God. And what does he use to direct us into his glorious presence? Words. He directs us with words. Words that save us, words that sustain us, words that give us confidence, and words that help us cope with all the things that this life has in store for us. Notice with me last tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and it's a lengthy reading, and starting in verse 6. It says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He says, look, this... This world, this perishable place, and, and these things that don't last, he says, this is just temporary. He says, and what we're telling you isn't according to these temporary things. What we are telling you are eternal truths. He says, but we speak, in verse 7, the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. Verse 10. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. For what? Man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but words which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What a beautiful promise from the Holy Spirit through the, through the lips of his faithful apostle Paul. He says, listen, what we're talking about are spiritual words. These are words of everlasting life. These are words of importance. These are words that go beyond anything else in this life life. Words that deliver us 
to the feet of God. And what a beautiful study it is to consider that God made himself come in the image of a man. To be like us, to experience life that we experience, to be tempted in all points just as us, yet without sin. And then to offer himself the sacrifice for our sins. Not only that, but then to inspire his people, his eyewitnesses who saw those very things, to write them down perfectly for us. And then to sustain those writings throughout history that every person who ever lives whoever has been created in the image of God, that we might draw strength, knowledge, and understanding from his very word, the word of God, the, the one that you hold right in your hands. It's proven, it's effective, it's truer than anything else in this whole world. You can have confidence in your Bible and you can base your life on the contents of that Bible, the very words of God himself. Holy words long preserved, for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. I want to encourage you to take a deep and reflective look at the words of God, to understand the word of life, Jesus Christ, and to then make your life one that brings glory to his name and that helps others also to understand the impact that his precious words should have in this life. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one. To allow uh, your sins to be washed away by a Savior who has given everything to save you. To wash away sins and to then walk in a new life. A, a life that brings glory to the name of God and a life that you will recognize the honor and the integrity of. If you need to do that, we encourage you to do that tonight. And if you are a Christian but you've struggled, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, let us know. We want to be your church family, and the family has to know what's going on in one another's lives. And until we share with one another, we won't know. So speak up. Let us know how we can pray for you and how we can pray with you and encourage you with the words that we've received from God, that we might pass them along to you and encourage one another in our faith. Whatever your need is, why don't you come while we stand, we sing. Create a new, make whole again. Your empty, wasted years, He will restore. And your iniquities, remember no more. Bring Him your every care. If great or small, whatever troubles you, oh, bring it all. Bring him the haunting fear, the nameless dread. Thy heart he will relieve and live of thy head, blessed Savior of us all, almighty friend, his presence shall be our unto the end, without him life would be how dark, how drear, but with him morning breaks, and heaven is near. Be seated, please.